Hi again. How we long to be speaking to a sea of faces instead of a camera and to have those real interactions face to face after we worship together and just share tea and coffee. How we long for life groups and small groups to be back face to face, sitting in one another's houses, enjoying that company and sharing with one another about what God is doing. I don't know how you're feeling in the, these days, but thank you for tuning in and setting aside this time to really engage with what we can together. I'm just going to read Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 11. It says, In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. We're not obviously the very first to set our hope on Christ. That was the New Testament church. But we carry on the very same spirit. We who set our hope on Christ can also live for the praise of his glory. So thanks for joining us today and investing really in that life together and personally. We just pray that these GFM at home services will continue to be a blessing and encouragement to you. If you're frustrated by them, bored by them, fed up of them, longing for something else, I urge you to allow that to set you seeking more of God in any and every way that you can. Don't give up, don't be complacent, don't let go. Let's keep pushing forward. Let's be longing for gathering together again. But let's not waste the opportunities that we have in the meantime. A few notices before we kick off. First of all, a big happy birthday to Carol Hiscox, who turned 60 on Tuesday. Congratulations, Carol, and belated happy birthday. On the subject of meeting together, you may be aware that we have planned a communion service again at the golf club on Sunday the 31st of January at 10.30am. At present, this is still planned to go ahead, but it's something that is constantly under review by the elder trustees and pastors as they await new advice and the situation changes. So if you do want to go, if you're able, and should it go ahead, please book in as soon as possible. There'll be information at the end of the video to explain how to do that if you're unsure. If, in the event that it is cancelled, we can then let you know easily. I would ask you for grace at this time for the elder trustees and pastors as they navigate these decisions prayerfully and seeking to do what's best to get a balance between the real importance of gathering in the ways that we can to worship God together and to share communion, but also, of course, following the guidelines and rules set by the government and trying to prioritise everybody's safety. Another thing to bring to your attention again, that we'll be starting a Freedom in Christ course. This is going to be on Tuesday evenings, starting on the 2nd of February, from 7.30 p.m. It's a 10 week online course. So it's gonna be held over Zoom. It will include video presentations and time for discussion and prayer. I'll give you more details over the next few weeks via email, Facebook and GFM at home. But please be considering whether this is something you could take part in to really invest in your spiritual development in this time when perhaps we can't do some of the things that we'd like to be doing. There'll be an information slide again at the end, just giving you details of how to get more information about that. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the truth that in you we have received an inheritance. Thank you that we are your, your children, your heirs. Help us to learn about that today. And as we join together in the music, Lord, we pray that your spirit would come, 
that you would be very present with us, that we would open our hearts to hear from you and to respond rightly to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Rachel and Jess are going to lead us in prayer. Thanks, Rachel and Jess. Let's pray. Psalm 8 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Lord, we are so in awe of your creation. 
and that the God who created it cares so deeply for each one of us. We thank you for our many blessings and are so grateful for all that you provide for us. We pray for our world, Lord, for the leaders of each country as they battle the pandemic. We pray especially for the political unrest in the US and for peace and stability in that situation. We pray for the work our church supports in Ukraine and especially for Lena at this time as she comes to terms with losing her dad to COVID. We pray that the whole family will be surrounded by your love and peace as we do for all families which, which have been affected by COVID. We think of those who are shielding again, for those affected by loneliness, for those affected financially, for parents struggling with homeschooling. May each and every one feel your hand upon them as we uphold them in prayer. Lord, as hope comes in the form of the vaccines, we remember that all our hope and trust is in you. As we look to the future, we thank you that the building work at church is nearing completion and has gone so well. We thank you for each member of the team who has worked so hard on it. We pray especially for Ian and Jill at this time, as Ian takes up his post as lead pastor tomorrow in these strangest of times. We pray that Ian and Jill will soon feel part of the family at GFM and settle into their new home. We look for your guidance as we go forward together into 2021, seeking your will. Fill each of our hearts with hope, Lord. Only you really know our daily struggles and can see into our hearts. Give us the strength and energy needed to get through one day at a time. And may we know your peace and love in our hearts always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear God, we pray for all skilled children and their families. We pray for all head teachers, teachers, support staff, lunchtime staff, caretakers and cleaning staff. We pray for all parents who have are homeschooling and all children who are going to school because their parents are key workers like doctors nurses and lorry drivers. We pray for everyone who is working in the NHS and are feeling tired and worried. We pray that the children will, rem will remember that Jesus loves them, that they can tell him when they're worried and upset. We pray for all of our church family. We ask all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
That's our prayer, Lord, that you might be high and lifted up amongst us. Speak to us now, Lord, as we listen to Andy bringing your word. Teach our hearts, we pray. Give us a deeper desire for you and to know you more. Amen. Hello to you. So this month, as part of our Living Free series, we're looking at, at a number of key truths, foundational truths from the book of Galatians about how we live free in God. And this morning, we're going to look at what it is to live free as heirs, which is very much going to link into what we've already looked at about living free through grace and living free by faith. But to begin, let me ask you a question. I wonder, how do you view your relationship to God? How do you view your relationship to God? And how do you relate to him? Let me put it like this. Does your relationship to God fill you with just a sense of joy, of privilege, of thankfulness, of wonder? Does it fill you with a sense of love and assurance? Or is your perception of God and how you should relate to him something that actually weighs you down or maybe leaves you apprehensive or unsure? To put it another way, is your relationship to God more about duty or delight? I think the Apostle Paul would put it like this. Are you living as a slave or are you living as a son? Today, we're going to look at a few verses from Galatians chapter 4. Firstly, let me give, just give you some context and remind you a little bit of what we've already looked at. We've seen how in Galatians, Paul is countering the message of some false teachers who he believed were perverting the gospel of grace. They were saying to these Galatian Gentile believers that to be fully accepted by God, to be really part of the people of God and to be complete in God, yes, they needed faith in Christ, but they also needed to fulfill certain aspects of the Jewish law, things like circumcision and certain food laws. They were in effect, I guess, saying to these Gentile believers that they needed to become Jewish. But Paul is saying, no. For Paul, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus are decisive. You are accepted by God through faith alone and by his grace alone. In other words, because of what he has done for us. And we're also transformed to live lives pleasing to God, not by external observance to the law, but by the work of the Spirit in us and being led by the Spirit. For Paul, as we've seen, to add anything to the gospel of grace is actually to subtract from the sufficiency of Christ's work for us. And this, for Paul, only leads to bondage. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He says, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so really this whole letter is directed towards the goal of helping these Galatian believers, and I would say all Christian sins, to understand that God has given us in Christ everything that we need. What God has given us in Christ, received by faith, is entirely, fully, finally adequate for all that we need for our salvation, and for our life in God. Now in chapter 3 and 4, which is really the heart of Paul's letter, the heart, if you like, of his, of his theological argument, Paul gives a series of arguments, trying to prove the point that acceptance with God and ongoing relationship with God are based on faith, not on doing the works of the law to perfect that relationship. And that this is the same whether you are Jew or Gentile. This is the same for all people. And in this section, he contrasts, and this really links in with what we're going to look at this morning, he contrasts the bondage of being under the law 
with the blessing of being in Christ. Paul speaks about how the law makes us prisoners to our sin. Not because the law is bad, the law is good, the law is righteous, but because it reveals our sin before God, it condemns us. And yet it doesn't give us the power to overcome, the power to live truly righteous lives. And in chapter four, Paul seems to widen this, even from, for those not living under the Jewish law, he, he, there are what he calls elementary principles of the world that enslave us, which he may mean, mean superstitions or untruths or ways of thinking that enslave us or keep us enslaved in sin. But Paul says Christ sets us free. And so instead of experiencing the bondage of being under the law, we experience liberty in Christ. We are forgiven. We are made right with God. We are made sons. And we're given the power to overcome and live righteous lives by his grace. Now today, I want to focus in on one of the arguments that Paul gives. He's used examples from the Old Testament to prove his point. And then at the beginning of chapter 4, he switches to an example from everyday life in that culture. And he uses a really powerful image. One that I think we need to get a hold of if we're going to enjoy the full benefits and the freedom of the gospel. And it's simply this. We no longer need to be slaves. Why? Because we are sons. We no longer need to be slaves because we are sons. I want to focus in on verses 4 to 7 of chapter 4 because we see here a remarkable parallel that brings this out, I think, beautifully. So let's read those verses together. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. It says this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I wonder whether you notice the parallel in these verses. In verse 4, we read that God sent forth his son. And in verse 6, we read that God sent the spirit. What we have here are two activities of God relating to our sonship. Now, I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes why I'm using that term sonship. But we have two activities here of God relating to our sonship, and, and I think two activities that we need to understand if we're going to enjoy the benefits and the freedom of sonship. The first is that God sent forth his son into the world that we might receive the privilege of sonship. And then secondly, that God sent his spirit into our hearts so that we might experience the privilege of sonship. And so we're looking at how through Jesus, through the son, we receive sonship. But then also how through the Spirit we experience the blessing of sonship. And these two truths, these two realities really work together. I think we really need to get hold of both if we're going to enjoy the full benefits of the gospel and, and walk in the freedom of the gospel. So firstly, God sent his son into the world that we might receive the privilege of sonship. 
Now, verse 4 and 5 flows out of what Paul has already said in chapter 3 about what it means to be under the law and what it means to be in Christ. As we've seen, under the law, we were enslaved. But the good news is that God sent forth his son, Paul says, to be born under the law in order to redeem us from the law. In other words, Jesus came and fulfilled the law perfectly. And chapter 3 talks about how on the cross he took the curse of the law. He paid the price for our failure so that we can be redeemed. We can be set free from our our guilt and our, our slavery and reconciled to God. But then look at the end of verse 5. You see, as amazing as that is, that's not the full picture. There's even more. The gospel goes even further. He says that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, as I mentioned, I'm I'm using that term son or sonship as Paul does. But maybe you're kind of thinking, hey, (laughs) be a little bit more politically correct, you know, be a bit more in tune with our cultural moment. You know, why not use the gender neutral term child? Why not talk of us as children of God, as the Bible does elsewhere? Well, the reason is because here Paul is speaking about a particular kind of adoption, where in that day a son was not only brought into a family, but he's talking about the time when he received his full rights as a son. Now, Paul has been incredibly radical here. He's using this image of sonship from the first century and he's applying it to all believers. At the end of chapter three, we see that in Christ, all, no matter what our race or our sex or male and female, no, no matter what our social status, we receive this sonship. In ancient cultures, the son got all the privileges, he got the inheritance, he was the heir. But in the first part of chapter 4, Paul speaks about a period before the son received his full rights and privileges. As a child, effectively, he could be like a slave in his own household. You see, what would happen is that guardians would be put in place who would have authority over him, who could command him. They would point out where he'd gone wrong. Maybe they would work him really hard, give him chores to do. However, there came a point in adulthood where he was no longer subject to his guardians, which Paul is relating here to the law. But he came into and received his full rights as a son. That's the adoption that Paul is speaking about here. Jesus came to redeem us from the law so that we, male and female, Jew and Gentile, can receive the full benefits of sonship. Now, how how should we apply this? Well, you know, often I think we can view our salvation largely in negative terms. And what I mean by that is we think of the things that are removed from us. For example, when we come to Christ, we are forgiven. And so our guilt and our shame are removed from us. But do we understand that our salvation not only includes that which is taken off us, but something wonderful that is put on us? Sonship. As sons, we are not only completely accepted, but in Ephesians 1, it talks about how in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. As sons, we have an incredible inheritance, an eternal inheritance. The Bible even says that we are co-heirs with Christ. Like we could spend all day unpacking the amazing privileges of sonship, and I don't think we'd ever really get our heads fully around it. But today what I really want us to see is the objective nature of this. This is something that we need to see if we're going to be free to enjoy the full benefits of the gospel. 
Your sonship has come about because of what Jesus has done for you. He came into the world to redeem us. That has taken place and that work was sufficient. And we receive adoption, we become heirs on that basis. It is past, it is historical, it is done in Christ, it's ours. There is a legal declaration over us. Our status has changed. We have the full rights of sons. God sent his son into the world that we might receive the privilege of sonship. We need to see this. But we also need to see that this works hand in hand with another activity of God that Paul speaks about. That God has also sent his spirit into our hearts so that we might experience the privilege of sonship. Both are important if we're going to embrace and enjoy our freedom in Christ. And really they work hand in hand. You see, note how verse 6 starts. It says, because you are sons. Because you are sons, it's already over. You have the status objectively. You are a son. You have the full rights. But because of this, there is something more. Whereas it was the son's job to make us sons objectively, it's the spirit's job to help us to understand and experience it subjectively. It says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now the word crying there is a strong word. It's, talk it's talking about how the spirit cries out in our hearts with a deep passion. But it's more than just a cry, it's, it's prayer, it's intimacy. It's a joyous expression and experience of the love and the assurance that we have in Christ. You see, the Spirit causes us to cry, Abba, Father. In the Hebrew language, as you're probably aware, Abba is the most intimate term for Father. In, in a parallel passage in Romans, Paul says we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so it's a deep inner cry celebrating the assurance that we are children of God, that we are heirs of God. I wonder, do you really know and enjoy your sonship? Do you know the Father's love? Not just objectively, but subjectively, personally. Sinclair Ferguson used the image of the prodigal son to show why we can often fail to know and enjoy our sonship. You know, when the prodigal son came back to the father, he said, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Ferguson says that Jesus was underlining the fact that the reality of the love of God for us, the reality of his grace, is often the last thing in the world to dawn on us, for us to really get a hold of. He says even as Christians we can live with what he calls a prodigal suspicion, where we're slow to realise the implications of salvation by grace. We are given the status as sons, but we have the mindset of a hired servant. And so what happens is, instead of living out of the reality of our sonship, we often fix our eyes on ourselves, maybe on our past failures, or our present struggles and inadequacies. Or we look at our performance, how well we think we're doing as Christians. And like the prodigal, we come in and we say, Father, I don't feel worthy, so give me a chance. Let me work hard. Let me try and prove myself. Let me try and clean my life up. You know, how many of us, I wonder, would affirm that we are saved by grace, but in reality, don't relate to God in that way at all. And so instead of living our lives from a place of acceptance and privilege, we're perhaps eaten up with self-doubt or a sense of failure or, or we always feel like we need to do more to prove ourselves. 
In Christ you have the legal status as sons. But do you really know it in a deep way? Is it the joy of your heart from which everything else flows? How does that happen? Well, take note again of the start of verse 6. It says, because you are sons, God sent his spirit into your hearts. In other words, the spirit's work is based on the son's work. If you've come to faith in Christ, your sonship is not based on experience. It's not based on the subjective, but it's based on the finished work of Jesus. In other words, don't base your acceptance on your feelings. Don't start with your feelings or how well you think you're doing. Start with what is objectively true. In Christ, you are a son. No other qualification is needed. There's no extra conditions needed. You are a son. You are a child of God. You are an heir. That's the gospel truth. Take it in. You're accepted. You're an heir in Christ and solely because of Christ. And what God has given us in Christ by grace is entirely, fully, finally adequate. Therefore, come on that basis. Nothing needs to be added. Come to him freely. See his love for you. See what he's done for you. And if you're doubting it, I maybe encourage you to go back, read Galatians 4, read Romans 8, read the first part of 1 John 3, read the parable of the prodigal son again in Luke 15. And as you do, listen for the Spirit. Allow him to speak to your heart, to fill your heart, with the joy and the assurance of your sonship, of his love. And even now, as you're listening to this, listen for the Spirit. I want to pray now for each of us, that by his Spirit, we would know deeply the joy and the freedom of the sonship that is ours in Christ. Let's pray together. I want to pray in particular for each and every one of us, that we would really get a hold of this. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that our sonship is based on your finished work, not our experience, not our fluctuating feelings. Maybe some of us need your spirit to touch us, to embrace us afresh with the Father's love. Lord, I, I think of the the prodigal son, the robe was there, the father was there with the robe and with the ring. The status was there, but he didn't believe in the father's love, in the father's grace. Maybe that's a picture of you. What does the father do in that parable? He comes close. He embraces the prodigal son. He kisses him. Lord, I pray that we would just know your embrace today. Lord, help us to see that the status is there. We don't have to add anything to Christ. We don't have to add anything to his work. We are sons. And we pray, Lord, that you would shed abroad your love in our hearts. That our lives, that our obedience to you would not flow from law, but love. That it would be an overflow of your love, that Christ's love would compel us that we wouldn't live as slaves but as sons, that we wouldn't live out of sense of drudgery and duty, but a sense of delight and liberty in you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would embrace us by your Spirit. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Let's sing again one last song and just use this 
song to affirm in our hearts the wonderful truth that we've been hearing about, that we are children, we are heirs of Almighty God. Lord, we thank you for the truth that we've heard and we pray that you would impress it more and more on our hearts, that we might know that by grace, through faith, we are heirs. We are set free to live free as your children, as your sons and daughters, equal in your sight. May we live more and more for you because of all that you have done and all that you have 
given to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you for joining us in today's service. Pray you've had a really blessed time. Just to remind you about a couple of things. Firstly, as Tina mentioned, we're going to be running a Freedom in Christ course very soon. This is a great course with practical application as we explore this area of freedom. The details are going to be on the next screen of where you can email to get information on how you can get involved with that. Secondly, if you have children in school years 5, 6 or 7, we're going to be starting a new Connect group on a Friday via Zoom. It's going to be every other week starting on the 22nd of January at 7pm. Again, there'll be a slide on where you can email to get the Zoom details for that. It's going to be good fun. And finally, just to remind you that every Wednesday we're going to be releasing a short video, a little devotional on spiritual disciplines. It's so important at this time to keep going with our spiritual disciplines. So please do look out for those. But for now, we pray you have a really blessed week. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye.